Okay, well, we're going back to the 16th chapter of Acts, if you will, please. Acts 16, just as quickly as I possibly can, I want to share with you some thoughts about how God leads. If you wonder how God leads his people, we saw some of that in our passage this morning, especially verses 6 to 12 of Acts 16. But I want to begin by just reiterating this truth. I know you know this, but I hope it's an encouragement as I remind you that no matter what it looks like, our world is not randomly spiraling out of control. God's got this. God is at work. And mainly, he uses his church to accomplish his redemptive purposes on this earth. And that's the reason why you and I, as individual believers, it is vital that we learn to see how God leads. How does God lead? If that's something that interests you, and I hope if you're a believer, that ought to interest you. If that's something that interests you, then let's check it out in Acts chapter 16 as quickly as we can, because there's a lot of it here. There's a lot of God's leading uh, brought out in this 16th chapter of Acts. You know, if you have experienced God's leading in your life, you know that sometimes he leads you in ways unexpected, sometimes in ways that really are unpredictable. But most of the time, when God leads you and I, his children, it is simply our conscious looking to him for direction and our willingness then to obey the direction he gives us. It's simply, to put it to even more simply, we depend on the way maker. God's the way maker. He makes a way. And it's simply depending upon him to make the way. Let's uh, take a moment. And as you turn to Acts 16, uh, verses 6 to 12, are how God opens and closes doors to direct Paul and Silas and their mission team to the specific place where he wants them. And it happens to be not in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, but rather on the European continent in what today is northern Greece. Then it was called Macedonia. And that first European convert, Lydia as mentioned in the 16th chapter. But I want us to see just some quick and practical ways in which God leads his people, and I hope that it'll be an eye-opener. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can meet together like this. Thank you for being so concerned about us and taking pains, really, to direct our steps. We want our lives, really, to count for you. We thank you that they can if we'll just look to you. How does Hebrews say? Looking unto Jesus. And so we're looking to you once again, this moment, as we open the word of God together, as we go through this day together with you in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the first things that I would say about God's leading is that it is personal. God's leading is personal, and there's two ways in which I mean that. God's leading is personal, first of all, from the divine point of view. From God's standpoint, it's personal. There's a glorious difference between the God of the Bible versus all the uh, other gods that this world looks to or trust in. Our God is almighty, and he is infinitely superior in power and in wisdom, and he's personally involved with his creatures. He's the only God that is. Allah isn't personally involved with his people. The God of the Bible is, and whatever other gods people follow. Our God is a personal God. And he is personally involved in our lives. And he will do so permanently. God 
wants us to connect with him. And he wants to be, uh, he wants to continually be at work in our lives and in creation as a whole as well. And really, this Bible that we have is all about how God wants to be in a relationship with human beings and how he has brought that about through his plan of redemption and how that plan was activated originally with Abraham. And through Abraham, there would be not only a nation called the nation of Israel, but out of that nation, there would come one specific individual. And we know who that is, right? He's the seed, and it's none other than the Messiah. So I begin by saying God leads as a personal God, a God that is personally involved in your existence and mine. Secondly, God's leading is personal when you look at it from a human standpoint. Obviously, God's able to work out the plan of redemption all by himself if he wanted to. God's capable of doing it all himself, but he doesn't plan to do it that way. God is pursuing and inviting you and I to play a part in his plan of redemption in his work that he's doing. He wants you and I to look to him. He wants you and I to find direction uh, through him in our individual lives because God wants to make you a personal partner with him. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that a privilege when you think of it that way? God wants you and I to be a personal partner with him to accomplish the greatest goal in all of human history. And that is to bring redemption to this earth, to the people of this earth. He wants us to be involved with him in something that is permanent, that will never pass away, that has eternal implications. When people get saved, they have eternal life, and God wants us to partner with him in that. And as you're willing to make adjustments in your life to be able to partner with God, you will grow to know God experientially in your life, and you will see God do incredible things in you and through you that you would have never believed possible. So that's the first thing. God is leading. It's personal. He's a personal God. He's intimately connected with human beings, and he wants us to lead. He wants to work through us as individuals. The second thing that I want to say about how God leads is not only that it's personal, but this is pivotal. This is pivotal, and it's this. Simply single-minded approach to life is how God leads. It's pivotal that you have a single-minded approach to life. What do I mean by that? I mean that you have one purpose for living. That your existence on earth, listen to me, that your existence here on earth is not so that you can make a living, not so that you can get ahead in life, not that so you can live more comfortably or make a name for yourself. Let me ask you a question. Well, uh, what are we here for? I mean, obviously, we have a responsibility to, to provide for ourselves and for our families, and I'm, I'm talking specifically to, to husbands and, and to men. Sometimes they're not in the picture, and so it falls upon a woman. I understand that. We have a responsibility to provide for those that we're responsible for. But is that how we look at it, that we simply have a responsibility to provide? Or are we striving for the American dream? big difference. And so I'm saying our purpose in life is really important. I mean, with all that you and I have, and we got a lot of stuff, don't we? I'm sure you have as much stuff as I do. You know, having moved my elderly mother, my wife and I said, we don't want to do this to our kids. <laughs> Let's get rid of some of this stuff. Let's start you know, party with it now so they don't have to move all this junk. 
I wonder sometimes, you know, what do we really need in order to, to live? What do we need to do God's will? Do we need to live the American dream in order to do God's will? Obviously not. You know what you need to do God's will? Just simply seek God. And when you seek God, you know what God does? He steps into your life and he begins that process of conforming you to God's image. And when God conforms you to his image, then you are prepared to be a participant in the plan of redemption with him. You can work together in God's plan to fulfill it. By the way, well, you have a responsibility to provide, but how does that fit in with seeking God? Well, he says this, if you'll seek me, I'll make sure that all that you need is provided. Doesn't that make sense? Isn't that a wonderful thing? You know, he doesn't say all that you want will be provided. He doesn't say that I will, I'll give you the American dream if you'll seek me. But he says, if you will put first seeking me so that I can conform you to the image of Christ, that you might be able to partner with me in my plan of redemption, I'll see to it that all your needs are met. You know what's sad to me? And I think I'm accurate. I believe that very few Christians ever really experience the truth of that that uh, principle of that verse that they seek first the kingdom of God and find everything that they need then provided for them I don't think many believers really experience that in their life because they got it backwards and they're seeking these things instead of the Lord and uh, they may not even tend to start out that way but it ends up that way somehow we get sidetracked we get things backwards and so it's sad because we don't primarily seek God and the things of God, but we primarily seek our the things that we think we need. We're busy building our uh, comfortable lives or some people empires and uh, they're building it for themselves or they're building it for their family. And God's purpose is for us to be his imagers. And in order to be an imager of God, you have to be willing to be conformed to the image of Jesus. You know what happened to him? He got crucified. But you know what? After his crucifixion, he underwent a resurrection. He got that total humiliation and crucifixion that led to a resurrection and glorification. If you're going to be God's imager, it's going to mean some sort of crucifixion. And I don't mean physically, but I mean in a spiritual sense, because that's the way God accomplishes his plan and his work through human beings. If we're any worse to God, we have to come to that place where we let him conform us to be like Jesus. So point is pivotal. And that is, what's our purpose? And our purpose is to let God conform us so that he can use us in his plan of redemption. And his plan for us then, when we fulfill that purpose, his plan is simply this, that if you are a believer, that, that God's seeing his purpose fulfilled in your life, he will use you to build and to populate his spiritual kingdom. You'll be salt. You'll be light. Uh, you'll be blazing a gospel trail wherever you go. You know, you might be the only one that's a believer in a particular spot where God has put you. You probably, even if there are others, you guys are in the minority. That's just the way it is. But the fact of the matter is, that God has planned for you to fulfill his purpose, that you might populate his kingdom with people. When we have a biblical focus on God's purpose for our life and God's plan for uh, our lives, you know what we're going to discover? When we follow God's purpose and plan, 
He's designed it this way. You will find that you will experience the greatest sense of fulfillment in all of life. You won't miss anything. You know, you, you might have wanted to be such and such in life, and maybe you didn't uh, reach that goal, but you followed the Lord's will for your life. Guess what? There is no sense of greater fulfillment than knowing that you're in and doing the will of God. At the end of the day, you'll be so happy that you did. And then my third and final point. Not only does God lead in a personal way and in a pivotal way, but in a very practical way. Turn, uh, turn back to Acts 16. And in those six to, uh, verses 6 to 12, here you see it, right? You see how they, they ha had gone through Phrygia, the region of Galatia. I'm not going to put the map up again. <clears throat> and uh, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go into that area of northeastern Asia because that was not God's direction for them at that moment, at that time. Later, yes. And after they were come to Mysia, they were going to go again up to the northeast. Uh, but the Spirit didn't want them to do that. Instead, he sent them westward. They got to Troas right there, that uh, port city on the uh, northwestern Aegean Sea. And Paul has a vision. In the middle of the night, this man from Macedonia appears in, in a vision and says, come over to Macedonia and help us. In other words, come to Europe, leave Turkey, come to Europe, come to the European continent and uh, help us. In other words, preach the gospel. And look at what verse 10 says. <clears throat> After Paul saw that, a vis that vision, he said, it says, we immediately endeavored to go to Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, they left Troas, and it says in verse 12, they came to Philippi, and that's where the incidents, the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16 takes place. Lydia is saved. The Holy Spirit wants to direct you in a very practical way, and I want to quickly just tick off three practical ways from this passage that the Holy Spirit leads. Number one, he leads specifically. Those verses that I've just read, specific ways, a specific route. And by the way, you've been driving, you got your GPS on, right? And you're driving and all of a sudden uh, you're to turn, but you miss the turn. And so you hear the GPS say, rerouting, rerouting, right? <laughs> That's what God does to these guys. He reroutes them. They thought they were going where God wanted them, and that's fine, but God had the liberty to reroute them, to turn them in a different direction. And he does it specifically. God specifically leads us. He reroutes them from the east to the west. And uh, when they get to Troas, it's like, okay, Lord, you know, where do you want us? And they wait for God's direction, his clear direction. And the whole process here, God is leading them step by step, and they finally reach Philippi. And when they reach Philippi, that's the spot. They're there by divine appointment. God will lead you just as specifically as you let him, as you want him to. You want specific, specific leadership from the Lord? you got to be willing to listen and wait for him to give you that. You know, there's going to come a time when I'm not going to be here anymore. Sometime God's going to lead me out of here. I don't know when that is, but I'm telling you, I will not take a step away from here until I am completely convinced that God has rerouted me somewhere else, okay? So that's, that's how God leads. He leads specifically. Secondly, he leads individually. I see that, don't you, in that ninth verse, where here's one individual, Paul. He gets a vision uh, at night of this man from Macedonia. So God will lead you not only specifically, but he'll lead you as an individual. I can't tell you what God's will, specific will is for your life. God will lead each one of us specifically and, uh, and, and individually, and he will reveal to you as a person. And if you're willing to follow God's will and obedient faith, he will lead you at just the right time. It's been my experience, and I think 
Some of you that understand would agree with me that when God gives you the word, it's like at the 11th hour. It's like, you know, you're panicking and all of a sudden, God opens the way. And that's, he, so he leads specifically and he leads individually. You can trust him for that. And thirdly, and quickly and finally, he leads people differently. Normally, God directs through the Bible, through prayer, through even your fellowship with spiritual brothers and sisters that have input into your life, or he providentially arranges circumstances. But sometimes, as in the case of Paul here in verse 9, he gives supernatural direction. This guy has a vision. Does God use visions and dreams nowadays? Not normally. But I'm not saying that he couldn't. I don't want to miss anything that God wants to do in my life. Sometimes God gives supernatural direction like that. In this case, it was a vision. That's all I'm going to say about it. But I want to close with this. I said in the morning <clears throat> that Act 16, especially verses 9 and 10, are very special to me. And there's a reason why. When I was a, a, a young seminary student, <clears throat> I had already a call of God on my life to be a church planter. The only thing I didn't know is where. Uh, God had put a burden on my heart. I didn't know specifics, but he had a burden on my heart about planting a church in New England. And so there was a church planting program at the, the Bible college that I went to. I went to the director's office and I said, I have a burden to plant a church. Uh, New England is in my heart. Do you have any contacts in New England at all? And he said, normally, he said, that's a hot spot at this point. And uh, I have a lot of contacts, but he says, now I don't have any except one. And I thought, wow, that's great. I don't have to be confused. I said, so where is it? And he said, Connecticut. And I'm thinking, that's not really New England. That's like just the gateway to New England. I was thinking, you know, way deep into New England. But anyway, I said, okay, uh, I'll be willing to pray about that. So I prayed about it. And I said, yeah, I think that I want to check it out. And so he said, good, we'll make a trip together. And so we made a trip to Connecticut. And we met with this uh, husband and wife, the one contact that uh, the director had. We sat down in their living room. And I remember the wife looking me in the eye and saying to me, if there is any way that, uh, that you can come here to this place and plant a church, by all means come. And so we went back and uh, he said, I'm going to give you the weekend to pray over it. Let me know, you know, on Monday what your decision is, whether you're going to go or not. Oh, the pressure was on. I worked full time. I went. I was going to school uh, nine hours part time, and I was working forty hours. And I had to work the second shift. So I remember uh, I got up on that Monday morning, real early, and I said, "Lord, before I go to work today, I got to know." And uh, so I just prayerfully started reading the Bible randomly, wherever I felt the Spirit of God wanted me to read. I, would, I read books of the Bible uh, that morning prayerfully. And I remember I was reading the book of Acts at, uh, in, uh, in the afternoon before I had to go to work. <clears throat> I was reading, I got to chapter 16, and I was reading this very section. And I got to that place, verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And I had a vision, though. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I read that, <clears throat> and uh, and then I, I uh, come over into Macedonia and help us. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit of God brought back that woman's words. You sat on that couch, and that woman appealed to you like this Macedonian man in a vision. She said, if there's any way that you can come and plant a church here, by all means come. To me... That was a Macedonian appeal. The Holy Spirit made that clear to me. Boom, I got hit by that. And then I read the next verse. 
And after we had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel. And I'm telling you, that 10th verse clinched it for me. And so I called the uh, director up and I told him I've come to a decision. And I got a word from the Lord and this is it. And so, yes, I will accept that to challenge. And uh, the rest is history, as they say. This is a special passage to me. That's how God speaks. That's how God leads. I wanted to share this with you, not so that you think that I'm anything, but so that you see that that's how practical God works. He speaks to us specifically. He speaks to us individually. And he speaks to us in different ways. You may not, but I believe that whenever you make, especially a major move, discerning the will of God, whenever you make a major move, it would be best if you had scripture like this to nail it down to it. I could go back there when I hit discouragements in the ministry and say, Lord, I know there's no mistake. I'm here because you called me here. I have scripture that I could go back to and stand on. And that's, I think, an important part of it. But uh, God leads. And I, again, will say this, that God will lead you just as much as you want him to and allow him to. If you don't care about God's leading in your life, you'll never experience things like that. You'll never, you'll never learn how God wants and can lead your steps. You have to have no strings attached. It's not, okay, God, I'll go here, but I won't go there. There's places that I would never want to be. One is Brooklyn, New York. Seriously. I was not a city boy. And yet, look at where I am. And I am content here. We're going on, what, 27 years now? 27 years we've been here. And we're content here. Be boring anywhere else, actually. But I'll tell you, it's not, it, it, it wasn't our choice. It was God's choice. I used to say to Matt Recker, he was here before I was, and he, he came to our church when we were in Connecticut before he ever hit the city here. I used to say, Matt, it takes a special person, you know, to go to New York City. Now I've changed that. It doesn't take a special person. It just takes a surrendered person. That's all. That's all it takes. It's just someone that is willing to do the will of God. That's all. Nothing special about us. But God's special. And God does.